Hey everyone, so the rest of this story was requested to me after my last video only containing the first part. I'm going to include that on this video just in case people haven't seen it, so if you don't want to listen to the first part, just skip ahead. I've been sitting here in the same spot recording and editing this for hours, so I hope you enjoy the video. Don't forget to add me on Snapchat and Twitter. I will always respond. Let's begin. So, I'm in a random Starbucks in the middle of downtown Las Vegas typing this out for reasons that are beyond me. I guess that if I die, I want at least someone to know what happened to me. You're probably getting the impression that I'm scared for my life, but you would be completely wrong. In fact, I'm having the most fun I've ever had. This is by far the best game I've ever played. Now, enough of my babbling. Let me indulge you on why I hired a hitman on myself. So... It all started about four weeks ago. I'm sitting in my office, bored as hell, staring blankly into my computer, counting each individual white pixel on that goddamn screen. As I'm staring off into space, enjoying the peace and quiet of my own little world, I start thinking to myself, how did I end up this way? My life has boiled down to me sitting in this fucking cubicle for eight hours a day, eating and sleeping. I sure as hell didn't grow up thinking, boy, I'd sure like to spend the rest of my life filing acquisitions for some soul-draining corporation. I mean, I make good money, sure, but I don't even feel like a human anymore. It's like I'm going through the motions. I have no kids, no girlfriend, no family that actually wants anything to do with me. I'm completely alone. I need some adventure in my life again, some excitement. Fuck anything is better than what I'm doing right now. I was snapped out of thinking how pathetic my life was by my annoying ass boss asking me if I had finished with this week's paperwork. I hadn't yet, but I lied and told him that I did. He told me in this, I am superior to you tone, to have it on my desk tomorrow morning. Yeah, I'll get right on that, you self-centered prick. I finished up the form that I had been working on and turned off my computer. It was 5 p.m signaling the end of another meaningless day. I got home and started thinking about what I could do to make my life a bit more fun. I went through the usual ideas of a vacation, moving to a new city, maybe even a new car, yet they all fell short. I needed something really fucking crazy to go down. I wanted to drop a bomb on my former life and really get shit started. I started fucking around on the deep web looking at all the illegal shit that they have to offer, and then I saw an ad that said, have a problem in your life? Hire one of our cleaners to take care of it at Cthulhu's will. Now my interest was piqued. I checked out their website and it was a site to hire a hitman. Then a thought popped up into my head. What if I hired a hitman on myself? It would be like a game of cat and mouse and the punishment for getting caught would be of course death. I was curious to see what their guidelines were and to see how far they would go to eliminate a target, so I emailed them saying I had a problem I wanted to get rid of. Within three hours I got a response back informing me all of the details of the business and the range of prices it would cost me. I didn't respond right away, allowing myself time to think carefully of what I was getting myself into. The more I thought about it, the more excited I got. This was the ultimate adventure game, like a real life video game. I would have someone that would spend night and day hunting me down, and I would have to spend all of my time hunting them down. The first person to find the other wins, and the loser dies. It was perfect. So I went into work the next day, knowing that it would be my last day there. I did what every cubicle monkey dreams of doing. I told my boss that he can go fuck himself, told the smoking hot receptionist that I wanted to bend her over the desk and fuck her brains out and destroyed every last form and file I had in that shithole prison just to make things harder for all the douchebags I worked with. Then I got to work on setting everything up. I went out and bought myself some new toys at the local gun store. Bought myself a new 9mm Glock, a PS90 assault rifle, and my crown jewel, a Barrett 50 Cal sniper rifle. I also stopped by this nifty little spy store in my city and picked up a few things. A few objects with discreet cameras in them that allowed me to watch them through my phone, bug detectors, and a voice changer. I then took $30,000 from my savings account and converted it into bitcoins. 
After all that was completed, I contacted the man who had first emailed me and gave him all of my info, and told him that this man would be very hard to catch as he travels a lot and that he may be armed. I told him that I didn't want just one of their regular cleaners on the job. I wanted the best that they could offer. Shortly after sending the email, I received a message back informing me that they would send one of the best, but it would cost a bit more. He also said that as soon as I sent the payment, they would get started. The last line of email he sent me made me realize shit was going to get serious very quickly. Just a quick warning for you. Once the payment is sent and confirmed, there is no going back. The job will be taken care of and there's nothing that can be done to stop it. Perfect. I sent the payment immediately and got a confirmation email back that it was received and that someone would be sent out the next day to my location. Now the real fun can begin. So there's the start to this huge shit show I created for myself and like I said it's been loads of fun. I've been in this Starbucks for about two hours and now and I need to get going as I can't stay in one location for too long. I'll update tomorrow with the rest of my story so far if people are interested. Wish me luck. How's it going guys? I need to clear some stuff up with you guys before I get into my story. First off, a lot of you have been doubting the fact that I got a 50 cal Barrett sniper rifle without a waiting period. The reason I was able to obtain it so easily was because the state I bought it in is a very lenient state when it comes to gun policies, and on top of that the owner of the store is my neighbor and he knew that I wanted one for the longest time as I have an interest in long range shooting. So all I had to do was get a simple background check and fill out a good amount of paperwork and it was mine. Secondly, a few of you are saying things like, you're not going to last a week. If you had even listened to the first two paragraphs of my first entry, you would have known that this has been going on for four weeks now. I've had a few encounters with the man and I'm hoping to finish this up in the next few days. Anyways, let's continue. So I had just gotten confirmation that my payment was received and someone would be sent out the next day. I started packing all the belongings in my apartment that I would need as I wouldn't be able to return until after this was all completed. I packed about a month's worth of clothes, all my electronics that I would need, all my guns and spy gear that I had bought myself, and a few other miscellaneous items like a toothbrush and shampoo. Once everything was packed up, I went over to my friend's house that had an older car for sale that was registered to his name. I asked him if I could trade him cars for reasons I couldn't get into and gave him $2,000 just to keep my car in his backyard and look after it. I figured if this hitman agency was any good, they'd look at my DMV records and know what kind of car I was driving in my license plate, which would make me a lot easier to find. He agreed and told me to look after myself and to be careful. So I set out back to my old apartment that night to put all the things I had packed up into the trunk and the back seat. I also set a little note on my coffee table in the living room that said, Tag, you're it. Just to fuck with the guy and give him a little heads up that this wasn't going to be an average hit. What fun would it be if he didn't even know that this was going to be a fun little game? I now had everything I needed to go in the hunt in the car that couldn't be traced back to me. Before the day ended, I went to Walmart and picked myself up a little prepaid smartphone and then dismantled my own phone so I couldn't be tracked via GPS. Before it got too late, I also stopped by the little spy shop again and picked up a magnetic GPS locator. You know, that kind that Walt and Hank from Breaking Bad put under Gus Fring's car to follow him? After that, I was fully ready to do this. No turning back now. I went back to the area around my apartment around 11 p.m. and parked about two-thirds to three-fourths of a mile away to wait. No way I could stay the night there and allow that guy to get the drop on me while I was sleeping. I sat on the passenger side of the car to make it look like I was waiting for a friend to come back to the car and to not freak people out who lived in the apartments I was in front of. They said they'd be sending him out the next day, so I had to sleep in the car and wait for him to arrive. I went to sleep around midnight and woke up around 7 a.m., I took out my nice deer hunting binoculars and waited, and waited, and waited. I finally got hungry enough to convince myself I needed to eat, so I went to a little fast food joint and picked up a few burgers. I went back and parked in the same spot I was before. It was around 5pm at this time and I figured this guy wasn't going to come during the day, so I fucked around on Reddit for a few hours until it got dark. I finally got bored on Reddit, so I went back to watching my apartment. Around 10 a.m. I watched an all-black car with dark tinted windows, I think it was a Chrysler 300, pulled up a few hundred feet from my apartment on the other side of the street. It looked a bit fishy on account that it had out-of-state plates I'd never seen in my neighborhood before, so I started to watch it. It just sat there for about 10 minutes, 
presumably checking out the house, then it drove away. Huh. Well, that was weird, I thought to myself as I had the biggest grin on my face. I knew that was my guy. I tried to sleep that night and maybe got a few hours in around 1 o'clock, but I was so excited with anticipation that I couldn't get a full night's rest. I woke up around 3 to 3.30 a.m. to check everything out. So I started fucking around on Reddit again to pass the time. Around 4 a.m., the same black car pulled up in the same spot as before. About two to three minutes of waiting there, the light shut off and a man got out. He was a bigger guy around my height, six foot, but way bigger muscle-wise. The dude could definitely beat the shit out of me in close quarters combat, so I knew I couldn't let that happen. The guy was also dressed in a really nice suit. What a fucking stereotypical hitman, I thought to myself. I noticed I had the biggest grin on my face again. I felt so alive. The man walked across the street and sure enough went up to my apartment. He took a key out of his pocket, put it in the lock, and slammed on it with this small metal brick thing. I knew it was a bump key. He then entered my apartment and shut the door behind him. About 30 seconds later, after he did that, I used the binoculars to focus in on his license plates and wrote down the number. After about five minutes, he came out and put something in his pocket. I'm pretty sure it was his gun. He also had something else crumpled up in his other hand. He threw it in the gutter, got back in his car, and drove off. I waited about an hour and went to go see what he threw out. Sure enough, it was the tag your it note I left him. I started laughing hysterically and knew this was going to be a lot more fun than I could ever hope for. I went back to my car to try to catch a few hours of sleep. When I awoke, the sun was already up. It was around 8 a.m. I drove off to another one of my buddies' house who worked for the DMV to get some info from him. He wasn't there, so I went to his work to find him. After about 15 minutes when he was in between helping people, I walked up to his counter. He was surprised to see me and greeted me with, What's up, man? I sat down without saying anything to him and slipped him a piece of paper with a license plate number on it. What's this? he asked. I just looked at him and said, Don't ask questions. I need the info of the person who these plates belong to. Dude, I can't give that information to you. I could get in a lot of trouble. I pulled out about 200 bucks from my wallet and slipped it to him and said, Please, dude, this is really important. This guy wants to kill me and I need his information. My life depends on it. Here's 200 bucks. I know you and your wife have been hurting for money. He looked at me with a really serious look and muttered under his breath, Fuck, man. He took the money and put it into his pocket and started typing on his computer. He then got up from his chair and told me he'd be right back. About a minute later, he came back with a few sheets of paper. This is everything I could get on the guy. I looked at him again with a really serious face and said, Don't mention this to anyone, even your wife. This guy is really dangerous and I don't need you getting involved and make sure no one can trace back the fact that you looked up his information. He looked back at me and said okay. As I was getting up to leave, he just said, Take care of yourself, man, and be careful. I told him that I would and that I couldn't thank him enough. I walked back to my car and started studying the piece of paper and once again had a huge grin on my face. I now had a bunch of this guy's info in my hands. I knew who I was dealing with. I'm not disclosing the man's name due to concerns for myself and his family, so we'll just refer to him as Mike. Mike was 35 years old and was registered to an address in Arizona. Like I thought, it was a black Chrysler 300. Now that I had the info I needed, it was time to stake out my house a bit more. When I got back, it was around 1 p.m. and I parked a little bit further this time. I sat in my car for about another hour and when 2 p.m. rolled around, I saw the same black 300 roll up about two blocks away from my place again. Further away from the last time, but close enough to watch the place thoroughly. I was only about a mile away from him and he didn't even know it. So... The Burger King I'm in is pretty much dead now, and I've been here for quite a while. I need to get back to my hotel and start planning some... stuff. I'll try to post back tomorrow when I have a bit of free time around 5 or 6 p.m. Until next time. How's it going, everybody? So first off, sorry yesterday's part wasn't too exciting, as I had to get through the boring parts to get to the kick-ass Michael Bay explosions part. Oh, and not sure if I'll be able to update tomorrow. And if I do, it'll be later at night. Why, you might ask? It's Mike's last day on Earth. 
the day he gets a bullet in between his eyes or through the chest. Anyways, enough of the semantics, let's get started. I had just gotten back around the area of my apartment and had seen Mike parked on the street from my apartment. At this point, I was done just watching him trying to watch me all day, so I decided I needed to test his abilities a bit. I went a few miles away to an old Motel 6. I walked in and a nice older man was running the front desk. I walked up to him and asked if I could book a room. He said yes, that would be fine, so I paid with my debit card. I also handed him an envelope and told him if he saw a man wearing a suit about my height asking for anybody to hand this envelope to him. He stuttered a bit, trying to get out, that he doesn't do that type of thing, but his attitude changed real quick when I pulled out a $100 bill and handed it to him. Oh, of course, sir. If he comes in, I'll give it to him. I then went about another five miles away to another Motel 6 and paid for a room with my debit card again. I handed this lady another envelope and pulled out a 100 and described a mic to her. If he comes in here, just hand him the envelope and he'll leave. She handed me my room key and I left. I then went across the street to a bit nicer motel and booked a room with cash. The room was on the second story and I had a clear view of the Motel 6 across the street. You might be wondering what was in the envelopes and why I booked three rooms. Well, first off, I needed to see if they were monitoring my bank accounts, and secondly, I wanted to see what his reaction would be when he finally realized that I led him to two dead ends. The envelopes were just two pieces of paper. The first one said, try again, and the second one said, so close, yet so far away. Now, to just wait. I got up to my room and took a shower because I desperately needed it. I then set up one of the hidden cameras that I had bought from the spy shop outside my room facing the entrance to the front desk of the motel across the street. I went back inside and waited. About two hours later, wouldn't you know it, the black car pulled up into the parking lot. As it sat there, I looked at the GPS tracker I had bought a few days prior and I knew I had an opportunity to put it on his car so I could track him. The only problem was if I even attempted to get close to his car, he'd know I was there and might even start shooting at me. I pushed the curtain of the window to the side and looked around and saw a couple of teenagers on bikes fucking around in the parking lot of the motel I was in. I put on a baseball cap and went downstairs trying to face away from Mike's car the whole time. I walked up to a soda machine that was downstairs and yelled at the kids to come over to where I was while waving a hundred dollar bill in the air. After all, I'm sure those kids would love cash to fuck around with or buy some pot. After looking at each other, they came over to me and asked what I wanted. I pulled the GPS tracker out of my pocket and told them if they wanted to make a quick buck, all they had to do was wait for the man in the black car across the street to get out and walk into the lobby of the motel and hide it underneath the bumper somewhere where he would have a hard time finding it. How are we supposed to do it without him figuring out what we're doing? One of them asked. I thought about it really quick and said, just ride your bikes behind the car and one of you will pretend to fall. Then, as you're on the ground, stick it underneath. They all looked at each other again and snickered, and agreed. I turned it on and handed it to one of them. I then handed the hundred dollar bill to another one of them. As he grabbed it, I held on to it and he looked at me with the questioning face as why I wasn't letting go. They all looked back at me and I looked at each one of them dead in the eye and said, if you kids just run off with my GPS locator and my hundred bucks, I will find each of you and kill you and your families. I'm not the type of guy you want to fuck with, got it? Their smiles quickly faded and they all nodded. I'll be watching from somewhere to make sure the job is done. You boys have a nice day. They slowly turned back around and rode off across the street, not knowing what I had just said was just a bluff. I took the back stairwell up to my room. As I got in to check the camera I had planted, Mike had just gotten out of his car and was walking across the parking lot. Just as he entered the check-in building of the motel, the kids entered the camera's frame. Just as they got near the back of the car, one of the kids fell and I saw him reach his arm underneath the car. He then got up and they rode off. About a minute later, I saw Mike leaving the motel lobby. He opened the envelope, read the paper, and then crumpled it up and threw it on the ground. He then got out his phone and called someone while walking to his car. He got in and left after putting the phone back into his pocket. I had another grin on my face knowing I was slowly winning the game. I got onto my laptop and watched the little red dot slowly get further and further away. About an hour later I decided to go check up on what Mike was up to, hoping to find the location of where he was staying. 
I drove to the area where the GPS locator was stopped at. I parked about a half mile away and started walking to his location. It was a little parking lot for a Mexican food restaurant, but as I scanned the parking lot, his car wasn't there. I walked up to the front of the restaurant and could see by the entrance there was a little manila envelope. I walked up to it and opened it. All that was inside was my GPS locator and a note that said, Tag. Now you're it. My smile and thoughts were cut short as a little hole exploded out of the pillar I was standing by. As I ducked behind the pillar, another hole was created in the brick wall that was now in front of me. Fuck, he's shooting at me. Where's the sound of the gun, though? I thought quickly. He must have a silencer. Shit, shit, shit. I completely fell for his trap. I'm such a fucking idiot. What the fuck do I do now? I pulled out my 9mm and peeked my head out from the pillar. I couldn't see him. Fuck. I had no choice but to run. He was closing in on me. I ran into the restaurant and went through the kitchen as a whole bunch of Mexicans were yelling at me and darted out the back door. I ran down the alley that the back door led to, my adrenaline pumping. As I neared the end of the alley, I heard something whiz by me, tearing the side of my shirt. Almost out of the alley, I ducked behind a big metal dumpster. I chambered around, popped out a bit, and shot twice at him. A loud-ass bang-bang sound shot out as the bullets exited the end of the barrel. Fuck, everyone around is going to hear that, and this guy had a goddamn silencer, so he doesn't need to worry about that. I need to get the fuck out of here before the cops show up. I darted out of the alley, and as I rounded the corner, I heard another bullet strike the brick wall. I looked back and saw a huge chunk taken out of the corner. I ran and ran as fast as I could back to my car, trying my best to make sure he didn't follow me. As I got in and took off, I looked back to see Mike running around the corner, looking around, trying to find me. For a guy of his size in a suit, he was sure is pretty damn fast. I then hit a red light with a few cars around me, and I could still see him running in my direction, trying to look for me. I could tell he didn't know what kind of car I was in by the way he was frantically looking around. He kept getting closer and closer until finally he was right beside me, on the other side of the street. The only thing that was between us was another car in the left lane. Come the fuck on, light turned fucking green. I was fucking hysterical at this point. The man that was trying to kill me was about 15 feet away, and all he had to do was look hard enough through my tinted windows and he'd know that it was me. He then continued walking past and pulled out his phone. Right as he hit the street corner, the light turned green and I fucking gunned it. As soon as I knew he was away from me, I started laughing louder than I've ever laughed before. I was so close to death and yet, I never felt more alive. This is exactly what I needed, and I already couldn't wait for our next encounter. Only next time it would be on my terms. I got back to my motel room and got upstairs. I sat down on the bed and started thinking about what had just happened, and planning my next move. I was such a fucking idiot for falling for that trap, he had seen those kids plant that thing, or he had some kind of bug detector like mine that could find planted electronics. I didn't know which one, but I did have a few pieces of valuable information. They were monitoring my bank accounts, he has a silencer and is not afraid to shoot in public, and from what I saw, he's not bad at his job. I had just gotten extremely lucky that I switched cars and he didn't happen to see me. I collapsed on the bed exhausted as the adrenaline wore off. About 15 minutes had passed as I lie on my bed contemplating everything and I got a phone call. I looked at my phone and it was a number that I didn't recognize from a 480 area code. I answered. Well, hello there. You left so soon we didn't even get to play. Who is this? I asked like a dumbass. I knew who it was. Don't worry about who I am. It's yourself that you need to worry about. I started laughing. Oh, Mike, my buddy, it's you. I don't think... How do you know my name? He snapped. You shouldn't interrupt people while they're talking, Mike. It's quite rude. As I was saying, I don't think I need to worry about myself too much. I'm it now, though, so I'll be seeing you soon, I said. A few seconds of silence followed. It sounded like he was in a car. You'll be seeing me sooner than you think. And then he hung up. I don't know what he meant by that, but I needed to get the fuck out of this hotel and into a new one. I wrote down the number he called me on, and I packed all my stuff up and got out of there as quickly as I could. As I was leaving, all I could think of was how the fuck did he get my number? I threw the phone out of the window and kept driving. As I was driving away, I saw his car pull into the motel parking lot I was just at. Anyways, once again, I need to get going. 
this bar I'm at is called the Blind Tiger and it's packed, but I've been here for too long and I need to get back to my hotel. I also need to start prepping for tomorrow. Thanks for listening, guys. Until next time. Well, fuck me, I had this whole goddamn thing typed out and then my laptop died, so now I gotta read this whole fucking update again. Okay, if it wasn't for all the support and messages asking when the next part would be out, I wouldn't even have bothered typing this all out again, but I know the feeling of getting your daily fix and I didn't update yesterday due to some events. So I guess I'll start all over. Anyways, fuck me, let's just get this started again. I ended the last update with me driving away from the motel parking lot and after a few seconds of me pulling out, Mike pulled in. If I had even left a few minutes later he would have caught me in my room packing my shit or me packing everything up into my car. Did he think I was an idiot? That I wouldn't change places after he ended our conversation with, you'll be seeing me sooner than you think? Or maybe he's having just as much fun as I am with this game. After all, you don't take up this line of work without at least partly enjoying killing people. I'm probably giving him the same rush he's giving me, in that he probably doesn't expect his clients to actually go after him or even know when he's coming. Anyways, I got to my next hotel and took a shower I desperately needed again while singing that stupid fucking Iggy Pop song, I G G Y, and, you know, shaking my ass in the shower. It's like a fucking brain parasite, and the only way to get it out is to sing the song of its people, or some shit like that. I don't know. Fucking sue me. After I got out of the shower, I passed out on the bed after having almost been killed a few hours prior. When I woke up, I knew I needed to get going again. After all, I was it. I went to Walmart to pick up a new phone and some supplies to make a few suppressors. Yes, I said suppressors instead of silencers. You happy now, gun fags? Anyways, as I was walking down the aisles watching all the fat-ass Americans on their scooters because they're too fucking lazy to walk, I started contemplating how Mike even got my number. I picked up my new phone and a few cans of Cheese Whiz, along with a few other supplies for my suppressors. And no, I'm not getting into how I made them, I just pulled the first guide online that showed me how and they were a real pain in the ass to make. A few of your guys' suggestions on how to make them seemed a lot easier. Anyways... As I was checking out, I took out my cash and looked at my phone. I was about to buy. It dawned on me that when all of this started, I paid for the first throwaway phone with my card. I'm such a fucking idiot, that's probably how he tracked me down. I paid for everything and got back to my hotel. The first thing I did was some research to see if it was possible to get a phone's ESN slash MEID number just from a purchase. It turns out, it was possible to do. It was just a difficult process of going through Walmart's purchase database or the phone's manufacturer database. Fuck. Another mistake on my part. If I keep fucking up like this, I'm going to end up dead. I took the rest of the day to make the suppressors for myself and they turned out pretty good. Except for the huge fucking cheese whisk mess I had to clean up. I now had one for my 9mm and one for my P90. After all that was done, it was dark out. I wanted to see if Mike would somehow be able to find me with no card activity or cell phone at his disposal, so I waited. A day passed by, then two, then three. After about a week and three hotels later, I figured he was only able to track me when I used my card and slipped up somehow like anyone who doesn't know a hitman is following him would do. Unless he was watching and studying me the whole time, which I doubt he was doing. By the end of the week of sleepless nights and constantly looking over my shoulder, I was almost completely out of cash on hand. I knew I needed to hit a bank or an ATM, but as soon as I withdrew some cash from my account, they would know I did, and the location I got it from. After a bit of thinking about this, I figured I could usually use this to my advantage. So I set out to surprise little old Mike. After all, a week prior he set me up, so I figured it was time to return the favor. I traveled about 30 minutes to the very outskirts of northwest Las Vegas. I found an area that seemed perfect, my bank on one side of the street and a desert with lots of boulders and Joshua trees on the other side. As I was surveying the area on one of the corners near the bank, I saw an ATV with a for sale sign on it. I went to the door and rung the bell. A nice, typical suburban dad answered the door with a little girl right behind him hugging his leg and looking up at me. Can I help you? he asked. 
Yeah, I actually saw that you had a Yamaha ATV for sale and I was wondering how much it was. He told me it was 1500 bucks, and I told him that I was interested. We shot the shit for a while and he told me about his family and that they just had another girl so he had not the time or money to keep this thing around. My time of fun and fucking around is on hold for the moment I guess, he said, laughing a bit. I laughed back and while I was looking at him, I kind of envied him. If I had a girl I loved a lot and some little ones that meant the world to me, I wouldn't be doing what I was currently doing. But that's neither here nor there. Sorry, I'm rambling. I told him that I was interested in getting it now and asked if it was okay if I ran to the bank to grab some cash. He told me that that was fine and he would be waiting outside. I got to the bank and as I was about to put my card into the machine a thought grabbed my attention. As soon as you pull out this money, you're going to be on a time slot until Mike comes in and checks the area. I mentally prepared myself and pulled out the cash. It was time for us to meet again. This time on my terms. I ran back to the man's house with the ATV and he was outside checking everything out on it. I handed him the cash and gave it a quick test drive around the neighborhood. I got back in a minute or two and thanked him for the time and wished him luck on his newborn. I got in my car and told him I was going to park it around the corner at the nearby park and come back for the ATV as I was going to be riding it today. He said that was fine and I took off. As soon as I parked at the park, I literally ran back to his house and hopped on the ATV. I had just pulled out the cash and I knew Mike couldn't possibly be on his way already, but something inside me knew that I couldn't involve this nice gentleman that I had just bought this thing from. I wouldn't put it past Mike to break into their house and kill everyone in there just to get a hint of my location. I drove the ATV back to the park and I parked it right behind my car. I got my backpack out from the back seat and put my homemade suppressors and my 9mm in there. I slung the P90 on my back and also rolled up a few paper targets and put them into my pack just in case I got stopped by the police. At least I had an excuse that I was practicing my shooting out in the desert. I eventually got about 400-500 yards out into the desert across from the bank. I set up one of the targets and fired two shots from both homemade suppressors from each gun. They both worked really well with only a small sound coming out of each of them. The sun started to set behind the mountains and I got set up and parked my ATV behind a large boulder. When it got completely dark I got on top of the boulder and I lied down. I put on a black ski mask and a black shirt so I couldn't be noticed out in the open. I flipped the cap to my scope on my P90 off and looked through it. I could see the bank dimly lit inside as well as the parking lot. Now, all I had to do was wait. It had been about an hour and a half to two hours since I had to look at the bank, but no Mike. Around 11 o'clock or so, I finally saw his black car pull up. He drove around the bank once and then parked in front of it. I immediately noticed that his plates were on the car, which struck me as odd. He got out and walked up to the ATM and had something in his hand with wires attached to it. He put it in the machine and turned his back to me. Perfect. I flipped my safety off and took the shot. Boom. Center mass. He fell into the machine and pulled out his gun. How the fuck is he even moving? I shot him right through the fucking back. He ran and ducked behind his car. I aimed for his tires. Boom. Back right tire. Gone. Boom. Back left tire. Gone. At this point he knew the direction I was shooting from and he popped his head out. He shot twice in my direction but he couldn't see me in the darkness. It was great. I had another huge smile on my face. Now you know what it's like to be trapped, you son of a bitch. But this time, you have no getaway vehicle. Alright guys, I was planning on going a little bit further with this, but I think I'm done for the day as far as writing goes. I'll update tomorrow. How's it going, guys? Sorry about not updating yesterday. I had a fucking massive migraine and couldn't even walk, let alone type an entire update. I was sitting on top of the boulder I had just taken the shot at Mike from, who was standing in front of the ATM. I forgot to mention during the last update that he had a mask on when he got out of the car. I could tell it was him though, with his suit and body shape. I took a shot at him and he fell onto the machine. I proceeded to shoot out the back tires on his Chrysler 300 to trap him. He was now a sitting duck with nowhere to run. He then went onto the passenger side of his car and dove through the window. I didn't know what he was doing, he obviously knew that his car was fucked with two back tires gone. 
he put it into reverse with the back rims grinding against the pavement. Then the car flipped around with the headlights pointing towards me. He gunned the car across the road and started hauling dick towards me. I shot a few times at the front windshield, but the bullet seemed to not go through. I now figured that he had some sort of light bulletproof glass or something of the sort. The car had now hit the desert, still accelerating up. About a hundred yards out from the boulder I was perched on, I saw the driver's side door open and him bail out. I shot once at him, but missed. As soon as I took the shot, I jumped off the boulder right by my ATV. About two or three seconds after I did, I heard a huge explosion and saw a gigantic flash of light envelop the dark desert. I started up the ATV and slung the P90 over my shoulder. As I rounded the boulder, I saw Mike's car engulfed in flames. I flew past it, searching for him with my 9mm out. He was nowhere in sight. I gunned it to the bank and ran up to the ATM he was just at. The weird electronic device with wires hanging out of it was still stuck in it. I grabbed it and took off. I guess he forgot it in all the commotion. I took off towards my car, still trying to look for Mike in the desert as I passed by it. Again, he was nowhere to be seen. I took off my ski mask and put it in my pocket as I was speeding down the street. I was pissed I had let him get away. It wasn't going to be easy to get another chance like that like I just had. As I arrived at my car, I heard sirens in the distance. I knew I couldn't just leave the ATV out in the open for the cops to find, so I found some bushes on the edge of the park. I took some wet wipes, I had my backpack and wiped off the handlebars and a few other spots where I thought my prints would be. I ran as quickly as I could after hiding the ATV and got into my car. As I was driving away, I could hear more and more sirens in the distance. I hauled ass out of the area in order to not be linked with what had just happened. It was about... A half hour later, I finally arrived back at my hotel, exhausted and angry that I missed my chance. I pulled the device that I had just gotten out of my pocket and started doing some research. I didn't find much on the outer web, but on the dark net, I found some similar devices. They were apparently for hacking into ATMs and pulling money out of people's accounts. I needed to figure out what he was doing with this thing, so I drove to a nearby coffee shop and used their Wi-Fi. I checked my bank account and saw several thousand dollars missing from my account. All of the transactions were in thousand dollar increments, one day after another. It blew my mind. They were taking money slowly out of my account in order to bankrupt me to slow me down. This just pissed me off more than anything. You weren't playing this game very fairly, Mike. Whatever the fuck that's supposed to mean. I went back to my hotel and crashed. When I awoke, it was already daytime, around 10 a.m. I finally got a good night's rest. God knows I needed it. I sat up in the bed thinking. Technically, Mike was it now, and I figured he was a bit pissed that I caught him by surprise. Oh, and on top of that, he destroyed his car to get away from me, and he probably had to walk for hours and hours back to his hotel, or call a taxi. It made me smile that I put him through all of that. He really went through a lot to get out of that situation. I mean, shit, his goddamn car was rigged with fucking explosive just in case he was put in a situation like that. It dawned on me that I wouldn't know what vehicle he was in now, which made my life a lot harder. He could be in any vehicle at any time, which sucked. I just sat on the edge of my bed thinking about all of this, and there was a knock on the door. My adrenaline was pumping again. I heard a key card get put into the slot and the door handle jiggled a bit before opening. I grabbed my Glock and chambered around and dove behind my bed. The door was caught by the chain lock. I looked up to see a little Mexican housekeeper looking at me. I put the gun behind my back and stood up. Housekeeping, she said while looking at me. No, thank you, come back later, I said to her. She shut the door and I hear her walking away. I had a huge sigh of relief and unchambered the round. Fuck lady, you could have been shy. Weren't they supposed to say housekeeping before they opened the fucking door? I sat back down on the bed and slid my hands over my forehead and through my hair. I could tell my body was having a hard time with all this shit going down. I got up and took another shower. I stayed in that night and ordered a takeout. 
The next day I switched motels and chilled out. I took another few days to chill out and recoup from everything that happened. On the third day in this new hotel, I knew I needed to get to the end of this game. After a few hours of pacing in my room and not coming up with a single fucking idea and stressed as hell because I couldn't come up with anything, I decided I'd go down to the strip and play a little poker to get my mind off of everything. I went down to the Flamingo Hotel and started to play a little bit. After a few hours of playing and winning a good amount, I decided it was time to pack it up and quit while I was ahead. I cashed out my chips and headed out to walk the strip for a bit. It was so crowded and crawling with cops, I knew even Mike wasn't going to take the chance trying to shoot me here. As I was walking, I noticed the Bellagio Fountain started up. I stood across the street admiring them and it took my mind off everything that was going on for a brief moment. As soon as my mind got sidetracked with the beauty of the jets dancing around one another, I saw something that shocked me to my very core. There was Mike, walking in between a thick crowd of onlookers watching the fountains. Holy fucking shit. Out of all the people in this whole fucking city, there's the one person that I was looking for right in front of me. He hadn't noticed me at all, so I started trailing behind him on the other side of the street. I lowered my baseball cap and kept watching him, always a few feet behind so he wouldn't see me. He eventually made his way to that Aria hotel and walked in. I waited about a minute and I walked in. Just as I had, I saw him make his way to the room elevators. No fucking way, I knew where he was staying. It was a one in a million, but something out there gave me a break and put him right in front of me. I walked up to the lobby receptionist and gave her some bullshit story about how me and my buddy got separated and I needed his room number to check if he was there. She asked for his first and last name and I gave it to her. She typed some things into her computer and gave me a room number. I couldn't have gotten more lucky. The more I thought about it, the more sense it made. If I were him, I'd want to stay in the most crowded hotels in Vegas, making getting found a lot harder. I thanked her for the information and took off. I made my way back to my car and drove back to my motel. I got in and took out one of my spare manila envelopes. I put the ATM hacker gizmo in it and a note that said, Red Rock Canyon, 6 p.m. Two days from now, take Scenic Loop Drive to White Rock Mountain Road and turn right. Keep driving until the road turns to dirt and keep going some more. You'll see an older car parked on the side of the road. I'll be waiting. You're it. I ran back to the area with the envelope and room number in my hand. I took the elevator up to his room, a nice suite. I wrote Mike on the front of it and took out some tape that I had, stuck two pieces to the envelope and stuck it to his door as fast as I could without making any noise. Hopefully, no one would take it. This was my only chance to finally finish all of this. I ran back down to the casino floor and got to my car. As soon as I got back to my room, I started to prepare. I took out my 50 cal and started to clean it, from barrel to the butt of it. I couldn't fuck this up like I did last time. I started to put the gun back together and there it was again. That big ol' smile had come back to my face. Alright guys, this is almost the end and there will either be one or two more updates. Again, sorry for not updating sooner. And I will be sure to update tomorrow, you have my word. Hey everyone, first off I want to apologize for taking so long to update, and secondly I want to apologize for not updating when I said I was going to when some of you asked. I currently have a massive fucking migraine, so I'll try to write as much as I can about the events that have been happening in the past few days, and then I'll continue on where part 5 left off. I got done cleaning all my guns at the hotel room, and I then proceeded to go to Walmart to get a few extra outdoor items along with the things I had brought from home in case I could no longer stay in a hotel room and had to do a little camping. I picked up about 10 of the 5 gallon propane containers two big 10 gallon gasoline containers, a big bottle of Jack Daniels and some other odds and ends to keep me sane if I had to wait for him, 
After all, he did have a reputation for taking his time to prepare and plan for whatever he was about to do. Unless he was setting a trap for me, he really got shit moving when the ball was in his court. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't this time, so I was prepared to wait. I stopped at a gas station to fill up my tank and the 10 gallon gasoline drums I had just bought. Once I was done, I headed up to set up and wait. I arrived around 11 p.m. I told Mike to meet me out at the Red Rock in two days from when I left him the note. I figured he was going to take the day in between to check out the place, for advantages and disadvantages, cover, terrain, and which spots would offer the greatest advantage over the other, i.e. high ground with lots of cover. I had already done this the week before, and I luckily have spent my fair share of time in the area hiking along just to get out of the city, even if it was just for a moment. You'd be surprised at how much more you can take in when you hike alone and don't have any distractions. I knew this particular area well, almost like the back of my hand. Mike didn't, so I had a few ideas on where to lay a trap for him if he decided to come the next day and do some scouting. I knew he would be looking for good ambush areas, somewhere I wouldn't expect and where he would have an extreme tactical advantage. There was an area about two miles in from where the paved road turns into dirt, big boulders surround the road along with tons of wild trees and bushes. Monsoon season was just coming to an end so the vegetation was nice and thick providing lots of sight coverage. I was planning on parking my car right after this area in order to provide the illusion that that's where I would ambush him. However, there's a big overhanging plateau formation way in the distance. It had three perch areas that looked over this entire stretch of road for about a mile and a half in each direction. This was my best chance I had, and I needed to take it. I arrived at around 11 p.m. and parked my car way off the dirt road and out of line of sight from people who would be driving on it. I packed up all my gear I would need for the night and started to trek up the area I chose to watch from. I only brought two of my guns, my 9mm just in case it's always good to have a backup and my baby that was a little hungry to do some hunting, the Barrett 50 Cal. I finally trekked up the plateau and just got the rifle set up for a good shot of incoming traffic. It was around midnight at this point and I figured I'd just relax with some jack and some shitty easy cook meals for a bit. I had no internet or phone service, so it was good old fashioned books and a few comics to keep me entertained. I had other stuff back in the car but I was content for the night. Around 2.30 to 3am I heard a car coming down the dirt road toward me. I was a little curious as no one is usually out here at this time of night. I figured it was a park ranger or some love crazy kids that just wanted to be alone. Wasn't worried about either as I had hidden the car extremely well and didn't have any electronics or any other things that would alert people to looking up in my direction. I watched as the car got closer and closer to the area I was planning on leaving the car for Mike to see. The car, a blue Toyota RAV5 had rental stickers on the sides of the windows which made me think it was some tourists enjoying the desert night. But then once I started thinking about it, someone who doesn't know the area, especially while traveling at night, wouldn't even leave the scenic roundabout, let alone come to some random off trail in the middle of bumfucked Egypt. It dawned on me that Mike probably had to rent a car as I, well, blew his up. Oops. I waited for a minute and after being stopped at the area for a minute someone got out of the car and holy shit it was Mike. He had a fucking big ass bulletproof jacket on along with some huge assault rifle. It looked like an AR-15 but way more decked out and more like something fucking Rambo would mow people in the rainforest down with. I waited for him to drop his guard and look around a bit and then I took a shot. Missed by a bit. Holy shit, how dumb could I be? I didn't reset the scope after cleaning the gun. Fucking details, man. So I went to another perch point and reset the scope, and then I added a bit of other things into the equation like distance and angle, and everything checked out. Mike was behind a boulder that was blocking my view from where I had a first shot at him. 
but this new perch was just to the side of it. He slowly inched his way into my scope and lined up a second shot. Boom. Holy fuck, this gun sounds beautiful. The bullet drop was a bit more than I anticipated, so I hit him in his knee. The bullet blew his fucking leg completely off his body from the knee down. I shot at the gun three times to disable it and empty my clip. I made my way down to him and he was looking at me with a shocked look like how the fuck did you hit my leg? I put a tourniquet on his leg but of course searched him for weapons. He still had that original 9mm with the suppressor on it he had first shot at me with. Memories, man. I then shot him up with an EPI pen I always kept in my first aid kit to keep him alive for a bit longer. A bit cruel, yes, but I didn't want to end it just yet. I had other things for him to see. I dragged him over to his car and put him in the front seat so I could watch him. I went over to him with the bottle of Jack and asked if he wanted a last drink. He sure took that fucking opportunity up, that's for damn sure. I loaded all of the propane tanks into the back along with both of the gasoline containers. We drove for about 45 minutes, him barely awake but still fully conscious and really enjoying the jack. We got up a little ways on the highway to Mount Charleston and eventually got up to a good straightaway with a sharp turn at the end with nothing but a little guardrail in between the road and about a 1,300 foot drop. I found a good sized rock on the side of the road and started to pour the gas all over the inside of the vehicle. All Mike did was close his eyes and wait. When I was done and about to launch it, I went up to the door and asked him a simple question. You want it fast and quick or long and horrible? He looked at me with a smile and held up the nearly empty Jack Daniels bottle. Fast, but let me finish this first. He chugged the rest of it and said something I'll never forget. I definitely don't want to die just yet, but you sure set up one hell of a fucking game for yourself. He knew I had put the hit on myself right after I left him that very first note in my apartment that said, Tag, you're it. He looked up forward out of the windshield to the sky and said, Do it. Make it quick and clean and light this fucking thing and get the fuck out of the area. Until the very end, he was a damn good sport about it. If the tables would have been turned, I don't think I would have been so nice about it. Boom. In one temple, out the other. I set the gas on fire in the back first and placed the car in drive. I then let it fall onto the gas pedal and the car took off. It strayed to the right a bit, but it was going pretty damn fast by the time it hit the edge. I was walking for about 5 or 6 minutes before the propane tanks exploded. They can handle a bit of heat, I guess. They went off one after another, and the last 4 or 5 of them all went off at once. I got off the highways and started walking the trail back to my area, and that's all how this should have ended, but I'm sorry to say that it hasn't. Mike and I met for the last time at Red Rock Canyon about six days ago, and ever since then some really weird shit has been going on. I really don't know for sure if they're all connected, it's obvious that some of these occurrences do, and the pieces that are fitting together are constantly leading back to one thing the organization I originally hired. But my mind is trying to make everything that has happened to me from the past six days, all of them fit together. I fear I'll miss something if I don't make them fit. Something that would end up saving my life, possibly. In the end, I'm just mashing up all of my experiences and clues I've gathered in the past six days, trying to find some sort of picture of the game they're playing with me. All I know is ever since Mike and I finished our game of tag, my life has gotten turned completely upside down. Enemies are everywhere, and worst yet, I don't even know who they are, what they like, and what they want from me. I can't trust anybody except for people I knew before I started this game. And in a city with this many people, I don't have a whole lot of options. First off, for the past six days, I've been having massive migraine headaches. It literally feels like there's an ice pick slamming onto different parts of my brain with each pulse of my heart. I got regular light headaches every so often like any other person does. There were nothing some Advil couldn't fix. These are different. They're happening every fucking day, multiple times a day, and nothing I could take can get rid of them. I have to wait for them to pass, which takes a few hours. 
I can barely stand when they happen, and light aggravates them. I even have my laptop screen on its lowest light setting to minimize this. Secondly, three days ago I was waiting at a light intersection in Henderson, a city connected to Las Vegas on the south side. The left turn light turned green, but the other lights for people that want to go through the intersection were still red, so I remained stopped, waiting patiently with no other cars in front of me. The first car turning left started through the intersection, then out of nowhere, a car going at least 60 to 70 miles per hour barrels through and t-bones the car. The car that was t-boned while turning it spun a few times but ended up on the other side of the intersection, finally stopping on the corner of the sidewalk to the left from my position, while the other car that sped through the light barely made it through the intersection coming to a grinding halt as its engines dropped and the front end completely caved in. Everyone slammed on their brakes and the intersection was pretty much wide open so I hit the gas and drove through and parked my car in front of her with my right side wheels up on the curb. I jumped out of my car and ran to hers praying she was okay and attempted to open her driver's side door but it was also caved in where the other car had impacted so the door lock was busted to shit from the looks of it. I ran to the passenger side and unlocked the door through the broken window, seeing the unconscious woman strapped into what looked like a metal death box. I had an unbelievable sense of recognition come over me. I knew I had seen her before, but I have no idea where. Like walking past someone that you've seen chewing at your favorite grocery store, or recognizing someone that jogs around your block in the morning. Only this time, you're both standing in line to buy movie tickets. You recognize them, and you know you've seen them around somewhere, but you don't exactly know where. I quickly pushed the thought out of my brain in order to focus. I tried getting her out of her seat, but I couldn't access the belt buckle latch attached to the seat as it was completely encased by the caved-in driver's side door. I searched my pockets frantically for my pocket knife and cut through the belt. As soon as that was done, I picked her up as carefully as I could and set her down on the curb just outside the passenger side of her car. Adrenaline is quite an amazing chemical when it fully kicks in and flows through your body. She felt like she only weighed 30 pounds when I picked her up. As I was laying her down on the sidewalk, I saw a little chunk of metal sticking out of her thigh through her tight jeans. It was protruding out about 3 inches, but I have no idea how far it extended into her thigh. I took off my belt. It's funny, I actually referred to it as my lucky belt ever since I got away while running from the cops drunk in college and because of all the other ridiculous situations I have gotten out of while wearing it. It's stretchy with no designated loop, so it can fit around anything as small as a stop sign post to something as big as the fattest contestant of the season premiere of The Biggest Loser. I sipped it under her leg and pulled it as tightly as I could a couple inches above where the metal was sticking out. Right as I did that, she opened her eyes very slightly and looked at me. Then after a few seconds, she closed them as she blacked out again. I kept my fingers on her neck to feel her pulse, and it was there faint, but it was there. I lifted up her leg really quickly to see a round red stain as a pool of blood started gathering underneath her thigh, trapped there due to her skinny tight jeans. Every 30 seconds or so I checked in, thankfully it wasn't getting much bigger. Looking back it seemed like time itself was going so slow as I got her out of the car and tended to her injuries. I completely blocked the world out around me. As soon as I knew she wasn't going to bleed out, I heard the faint sound of sirens in the distance. Reality snapped back as I look around to survey the scene. Mostly, people were just standing around on the opposite side of the street from where I was, some on their phone, presumably to 911, and others just shocked at the accident they had just witnessed. I looked over to see two people pulling the man who ran the red light out through his window, his car about two-thirds the length it used to be. Even a bit of the front doors of the car were warped a bit, which explained why they couldn't get them open. It maybe took the paramedics four or five minutes to get to the scene, but it felt like an eternity. Two ambulances came flying to our location. One went and parked by the other man's car, and one parked in front of mine. I checked her pulse one more time, and it was still there. Faint, and it damn sure seemed to be clinging to life, but nevertheless, it was there. As soon as he took her vitals and gave her a quick look over, he asked me for a quick summary of what had happened. I explained and asked if she was going to make it and be okay. 
To my relief, he said yes and explained she might not have made it if it wasn't thanks to my belt and the fact that I had left the object in her leg. I learned as a young kid in Boy Scouts never to remove an object that was stuck in a person as it can lead to even more blood loss and then very quickly, death. And proper tourniquet placement on the arms and legs to prevent a person from bleeding out. I chuckled a bit inside. Who would have fucking imagined that I would ever put any of this stuff I learned from my first aid badge to use in the real world? He asked if I wanted my belt back and I told him no, and to attach a note to it that explained that it was her lucky belt now and that it saved her life. We laughed for a quick second as he agreed and as I turned around police officers were approaching me. I'm not too big of a fan of cops, but I figured I was not in any sort of trouble as I had just helped secure the victim of an accident. He asked me if I could give a statement as to what happened and I agreed. He turned around and asked me to follow him to his car to get the paperwork and I saw the other man sitting up on the stretcher the other EMTs pulled out. He was yelling and slurring his words and acting as any obliterated person at would after they had just been in a bad accident. I kept looking at him and he seemed familiar as well. I didn't recognize him as well as I did the woman I'd helped but I had definitely seen him before. I heard him shout in a drunken manner at the EMT. My brakes didn't stop. The brake pedal didn't do nothing. I couldn't stop, he said, extremely drunk. When we continued to the cop car, I gave him my statement. As we were finishing up, another cop came up to the side of him chuckling a bit and said, This guy's BAC was .21, according to the breathalyzer. We also found a half-empty beer can over on the passenger side door. He's saying something about his brakes not working, but he's so fucked up he probably was hitting the gas pedal instead. The officer taking my statement nodded and the other cop walked off back to the scene as the tow trucks had just arrived. The officer who was taking my statement turned and put the pad and pen on the seat of the squad car. We're done here, he said in a serious tone, and I turned to walk away. I took a few steps away and I heard him say, Oh, by the way, yeah, I asked. I heard you save that woman's life by slowing the bleeding down until we got here. I turned around and said, I don't think I saved her by any means. I was just trying to give her as much time as she could get until the paramedics arrived. I was turned around and started walking away and heard him say in a quiet, deep voice, Hmm... Seems like he did the opposite for the other guy who flew off the mountain pass on the other side of Mount Charleston a few nights ago. Perfect place to go off, too. Must have been at least a thousand foot plunge or more. I stopped, dead in my tracks. All the blood that was in my face fled, replaced with a substance that felt cooler than liquid nitrogen. Frozen there and without turning back around to face him, uh, I excuse me? I asked, my very soul not wanting to hear his answer because I knew I was completely fucked. Oh, nothing. You saved one life and ended another. I think that God would call that even, don't you think? He said, his voice getting more and more cheerful after each syllable left his mouth. Like a proud hunter knowing his prey was cornered with no possible way to escape. Feeling like I was frozen in a block of ice, having nowhere to go, I replied, uh, I, I can't really say. God hasn't said anything to me yet, but I'll let you know when he does. As I spoke, I literally felt like a dead man walking, like this man behind me was taking the very energy of my soul as he stared at me. He started laughing. Well, who knows, you may get that chance sooner than you think, he said and then his voice suddenly going back to the previous deep, monotone darkness it was before. But, who am I to say that? I heard him turn around and take a few steps into his cop car and shut the door behind him. I was just standing there frozen until I heard the car door shut, causing the regular world to return as I slowly walked back to my car. And after this occurred, my laptop I was using to catalog everything I've done so far, check my bank accounts, look at pretty much all my information on it that I needed to stay ahead, started acting up about a week ago. Randomly closing internet tabs, me being in the middle of writing an update on this, and my laptop would shut itself down. 
and the final straw was my command bar popping up on its own and writing out, We are watching. We are everywhere. Without me touching my computer. They now had complete control of it and that it's just useless to me. So I had to get a new one and make sure it doesn't get hacked. Anyways guys, looking back at what I just typed, I pretty much wrote a whole fucking prologue to what happened after the game. I'll update if it continues on from here, but don't count on every day. Hey everyone, so sorry for the last story looking like the ramblings of a crazy person. My migraine at the time just kept getting worse and worse, and by the time I was done writing I couldn't even proofread or even stare at my screen any longer. I was literally shaking with pain about to just kill myself to get it over with. Don't worry, I'm not suicidal. Well, by suicidal I mean personally killing myself. I guess some would argue that what I did was suicide. In my opinion, it was more of a game, but hey, call me what you want, I honestly don't care. Anyways, I figure I'd leave one last quick update to let you guys know what's been going on, and it might just be the last day of my life. Let me explain. So I took my hard drive I had saved from my laptop I had gotten rid of to a buddy of mine who was a programmer to check for how the hell they hacked into my system. I wanted to keep it because I had some shit on it that had some sentimental value to me and I didn't want to find all the songs and movies I'd downloaded all over again. Anyways, he transferred the things I still wanted over to my laptop and ran all the files through a program to check for abnormal files or viruses hidden in any of the transferred data. He didn't find any, so I was in the clear there. I didn't tell him what had happened in the past month. He just figured I was busy at work or whatever. He downloaded some security software on my new laptop and gave me a few tips on how to avoid my security from getting breached. I probably should have told him that it wasn't just some random guy hacking my system, but if I got into details it could possibly put him at risk, so I just thanked him and went on my way. As I was getting back to my hotel and going up to my room, I saw a man in a suit standing across the street, just staring at me. I went inside, freaking out, and checked out the window every couple minutes to see if he was still there. After a few peeks of him still looking right at me, he got on his phone and eventually left. Shortly after, I went to a hotel, taking U-turns and backtracking to make sure I wasn't followed. I checked in and went to my room to check it out. I took my bug detector and went around the room. Nothing came up, luckily. As I went outside to get my bags... Out of my bag, I felt like I was being watched again. I looked around thinking I was just being paranoid and fucking again there was a different guy in a suit just watching me. Holy shit, how many guys do they have watching me this time? And why haven't they all just killed me already? Well, I'll find out soon enough. I went into my room and started thinking about everything that had happened since I killed Mike. I started thinking about the car crash I'd seen and the people I saw in it. After thinking for hours, the girl in the car that was T-boned. I did know her. She worked in a different branch for the company I used to work for. She didn't work in my building and I didn't even know if she worked in the same city since my company was in several different states. But I was sure I've seen her in my office dropping papers off to my boss. Why her though? Was it a fluke? And then I thought about the cop afterwards. No one was around when I killed Mike. There was no report on the news about it. I wore gloves so there wouldn't be any prints. And I torched the whole fucking car. What the fuck is going on? Fuck it. I had no idea and I'm dead anyways. I went to my computer and opened it up to look at a good bar to get fucked up at. Another command bar was open and it said, We need to talk. Sunset Park, tomorrow, 8 p.m. Go to the southeast corner, come alone. If you pull anything, you will be shot. Don't be stupid. Well, fuck it, they know where I am, anywhere I go. They have people everywhere, and I'm willing to bet they'll go to any length to find me. Maybe they just haven't killed me yet, because they want a private place where it'll be easy to do it and to dispose of my body. I can't run anymore. I don't want to run anymore. I had the time of my life and now it's not fun anymore. Oh well. 
I'll see what they want. And I'm gonna go get shit faced and have a good time. Goodbye everyone. And in the words of the famous Ron Burgundy, stay classy.